Welcome, Grade 9, to Lesson 9.4. We've been doing a lot of discussion on samples versus census and when to do each one. Now, what I want to do now, though, is I want to talk about the different types of samples that are available for you to choose from. So let's take a look here. Fredericton High School in New Brunswick has 3,300 students in grades 10, 11, and 12. It is so large that there are two separate lunch hours, one from 11.30 to 12.30, and another from 12.30 to 1.30. The school cafeteria wants to change their menu to better reflect the food students want. Asking all the students is too time consuming and requires too many resources, therefore, a sampling is required. So I want to start off with asking you, how would you select the sample to use here? How would you collect this information? So pause the recording and write that down. All right. So obviously, how would you select the sample? Well, you have to ask a portion of the students and staff who use the cafeteria. You have to go in there and ask the students and the staff who use the cafeteria what kind of food they prefer. Now, do you think you could ask every person who comes through the line? Pause the recording. I'd like you to say yes or no and tell me why. So could you ask every person who comes through the line? No. It would take too long and hold up the line. We're talking about over 1,500 students who would be going through the line if they were eating there at the cafeteria. So how could you sample the people who use the cafeteria? So what ways that are available to you are going to be explained a little further down. But you could ask every fourth or fifth fifth person in the line, or you could have a table set up to allow students to volunteer to be surveyed, or you could have it uh, published and it's going to be on the school website or you, something of that nature too. Do people use the cafeteria other than lunch, and would they have an interest in what was served? Well, the answer to that is yes. There's a lot of people who go for snacks after the regular meals, or they go in there to study on the tables, and they're going to want something which is a little bit different than a bowl of macaroni and cheese. So how would the survey results be affected by the lunch special of the day? So I'd like you to pause recording, and I'd like you to tell me why you think the survey results would be affected or could be affected by the lunch special of the day. Well, here's the thing. If the special is well liked, it would be very positive for the cafeteria and for the stuff that they actually take and produce. But if it's something they don't like, you're going to get a lot of negative opinions. Because it kind of sets the stage for how they're going to answer. So do you think that the results from this type of sampling would be valid? Asking every third, fourth, or fifth person. Well, here's the thing about when you do a sample. As long as all the stakeholders had a proportional chance to participate, then your answer would be yes. If there was only grade 10s and half the grade 11s in the first lunch hour, and that's when you did your survey, the other half of grade 11s and the grade 12s wouldn't get a chance to answer. So therefore, sampling in the first lunch hour wouldn't work. So you have to sample through both lunch hours. Suppose you want to increase the amount of healthy foods and decrease the unhealthy snacks. How would you adjust your sampling? So now I want you to be sneaky. I want you to try to get a result that would be saying that everybody wants more healthy foods. So how would you go about sampling that? Pause the recording and do that. All right. If you want to have healthy food, you'd have to probably find somebody who is interested in nutrition. So if there's a nutrition class, and there would be because there's 3,300 students, or you could talk to the school nurse, or you could talk to some adults you know who are in favor. You could talk to some of the people who are in charge of the cafeteria, possibly some of the chefs, anything like that, which would be resulting in you getting a we need more healthy foods result. So let's look at the different types of sampling. Sampling falls into several categories. These are the ways that you can do a sample. The first one is called simple random sampling. Now, what you do here is each member of the population has an equal chance of being selected that is in the total population. So you take your total population and you randomly draw uh, your selected respondents from that total population. Now, that has good, pro good things and bad things about it. The good things is, you're using random. 
when anything is done with random, you're, you're not going to have any bias as long as you selected your, your demographic group properly. The other problem is, if your sample is too small in a simple random sampling, like for example, you take a look at school and you do a simple random sampling, you may only get from grades you know, four to seven or something like that, because it's random. It's possible. It could happen. That doesn't include the people from grades one, two, and three, and from grades eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So you have to be careful with that. A way to get around that is to use systematic or interval sampling. In this situation, every nth member, like every fifth or sixth or seventh member of the population is selected. So, for example, if you're in town, you could go through a phone book and select every 20th person. You could go through a class, you could select every second person. You could go through uh, the, you know, the whole class list, or the whole school list of, of students and take every 30th person or every 20th person. Now, this is used a lot in manufacturing to test for quality because then it doesn't matter what time of day is, you're going to be taking off one from every part of your assembly line and you're going to be able to test it to find out whether or not it's within your know, specs or not. Now, the next one's called cluster sampling. Now, cluster sampling is where every member of each randomly chosen group of the population is selected. So, for example, at a mall, each store is considered. So it's kind of like going to different locations and sampling each different location. Self-selected sampling. This one here is where only members of a population who are interested in volunteer get to participate. For example, you mail out a survey to all the people in the community and only those interested fill it out and mail it back. There's a lot of issues with self-selected sampling depending on what you're trying to gather information about. If it's a controversial topic, you always get people who are what called extremes. They're really for the issue or they're really against the issue. So for example, if I were to use abortion, which is a very, very uh, conflicting topic for a lot of people, if I use a self-selected sampling, only those people who are really affected by the abortion issue would be ones who are going to be the primary respondents. Okay, now, convenience sampling. In convenience sampling, only members of the population who are convenient to include are selected. For example, to find out homework habits that those people in the hall who are easily approached are asked, right? Or you could go to a mall and you could just grab people randomly out of, out of the mall. Those are convenience and are easy to collect. Now, in stratified, some members of each group of the population are randomly selected. So in a school, you would randomly select members from each class. Now, in some schools, we have in the rural area, there's what's called, a, they're called feeder schools. So they have a lot larger high school and junior high than they have in elementary. So if you chose systematic or interval sampling, and you chose every 20th person or every fifth person, so if you have a small school, you're looking at 20 people in each elementary class. Whereas in junior high and high school, it increases up to maybe 30 or it can sometimes even go as high as 90 people in the high school. So the high school people, if you went every fifth person, you get a lot more people than you get in the elementary. So the elementary's uh, votes would be less effective than the high school. To get around that, you do what's called stratified sampling. You go to each grade and you select the same amount of people from each grade randomly. So that each one of the groups is equally represented in your sample. Okay, let's look at identifying appropriate samples. To find out how to improve the local Walmart, a survey team considers the following sample methods. For each method that they consider, I want you to tell me what sampling method is being used and then explain whether the sampling method that they're using is actually appropriate. So let's take a look at, at A. For the whole day, the names and phone numbers are collected from each customer that visited the store. And that evening, the names of 100 randomly selected people are chosen to be contacted for that survey. So pause the recording and I want you to look at the previous page and I want you to go through these different types of samples and I want you to tell me what actually was done here in A. So pause the recording and tell me the type of sampling and whether you think it is effective or not. All right, let's take a look here. First off, this is called simple random sampling. You're going to collect everybody from the day and you're going to just select from them. 
Now that's appropriate. However, there are some difficulties with it. Number one, gathering the names of the phone numbers may be difficult in some cases. And the other problem is you're only doing it for one day. And that means that the people who come on other days are not going to be selected. And that's very important when you take a look at a weekday versus a weekend. A lot of people can't go during the day shopping at Walmart. They prefer to do it during the weekends. So if you chose a weekday, you get one group of people. If you chose a weekend, you get another group. So that's one of the flaws with this particular method. OK, let's look at the next one. As people exit the store, every fifth person is surveyed. So identify the type of sampling that's being done, and tell me whether you think that it's appropriate. So pause the recording and do that now. This is systematic sampling. If you go back here, you can see it's right down here. It's called systematic or interval sampling, where every nth member of a population is being taken and uh, sampled. This may or may not be appropriate depending on the day sampling is done. It's the same thing as A. A weekday versus a weekend would cause a problem. Now, this is a perfectly good way of doing it for collecting the sample, but you have to be careful about the days that you do it. Each person on the sampling team asks their friends. So take a look at what you think would be happening here. This is called convenience sampling. And the sample is not likely to be appropriate because friends usually share the same views and ideas. For example, younger workers will not really have an opinion on gardening, service, food in the food section, baby clothes, diverse footwear or tools, etc. They will have an interest in what they like, like electronics, junk food, and their own personal clothing, stuff like that. So this is not a good way of doing it. Now let's take a look at D. An announcement is made on the announcement system that all people who wish to fill out the survey can approach the customer service desk by the door and do so. So what kind of sampling is this, and do you think it's appropriate? This is called a self-selected sample. And it's not appropriate because only the customers who have strong opinions will respond. Those people who are not there to hear the announcement will not get an opportunity. Those people who come on different days will not hear it, and they can't respond. So this is a situation where it's not a good way to do it. OK, choosing appropriate samples. Mr. Jones retires from teaching and gets a job at the Cadbury Dairy Milk Chocolate Bar Factory in Edmonton. The boss of the factory told Mr. Jones that his job is to check and sample the first three boxes of dairy milk chocolate bars produced each day. So I want you to pause the recording and I want you to tell me, do you think this is a good way of ensuring quality control? So pause the recording and do that now. This is not going to be a good way of doing this. The quality has got to be the same throughout the whole day. So sampling only at one time in the morning is not going to be good because later in the day, workers may become bored or tired or mistakes may happen and poor quality dairy milk chocolate bars could be produced. The quality check has to be the same all day. So what are two other methods you think of sampling that would be appropriate? So pause the recording and I want you to tell me two sampling methods you think would be appropriate here. Well, one of them would be systematic, and that would be a very good one to use because every 50th box or, or maybe every hour a sample is taken on time, these types of sampling methods would guarantee that you're going to be doing sampling throughout the whole production line, throughout the whole day. Another way would be a simple random selecting method based on time or the total number of boxes produced each day. So for example, you could say uh, do a random time selection. So you pick at 8 o'clock, check at 8.15, check at 9.27. These could all be randomly selected. Or, so you could also check the number of boxes produced. So you could say check the first box, check the 20th box, check the 207th box. These would all be randomly selected. Now, what are two other methods of sampling that would not be appropriate? So typo there. So what ones would be not appropriate? So pause the recording and I want you to tell me. OK, so inappropriate methods. The first one, sample every single one of them. Well, this is destructive sampling. And if you had Mr. Jones taking a bite out of every chocolate bar that was produced in that factory, you wouldn't have anything left to sell, unless, of course, you want to sell them with a the bite taken out. 
The second one, self-selected. When we look at self-selected, you can't make an announcement and tell the chocolate bars to come forward to be, to be tested. That's not going to work. So we have to rely on the people who are there. So you would be calling out people and saying, OK, uh, when you think about it, grab the box and bring it over to Mr. Jones to do a uh, to do a test on. Now, depending on when that was done during the day, uh, you may get most of your stuff in the morning. You may have some people who are really who need to go for a walk, and they're going to be giving you samples very, very frequently. Or you may have some people in some time of the day that they don't select anything for you to test. Cluster sampling. Now, cluster sampling is not going to work. You can't just walk around and say, OK, look, we're going to do a sample here. And then we're going to wait, and we're going to do another sample here. And then we're going to do another sample. And taking uh, like you know 15 boxes and taking chocolate bars out of each box to test. Cluster sampling is not a good idea, because you will probably miss other time slots. And of course, the last one would be convenience sampling. If you just had Mr. Jones walk to the time when he wants to do this, and he could just select chocolate bars wherever he wanted, whenever he wanted, this is a good, there's a good chance that he would not be able to test all the time slots. So the next one is sampling of a population when we're dealing with products produced can either be either a destructive sampling or a non-destructive sampling. So this is just looking at the difference between the two of them with the type, with the, uh, typo there. What is the difference between destructive and non-destructive sampling? I'd like you to define destructive and non-destructive sampling for me and put it down on the paper, please. So pause your recording and do that now. So the first one is destructive sampling. And this destroys the tested product. So some tests which are destructive are taste testing, load testing, and crash testing. If you crash test every one of your cars, you're not going to have anything to sell. If you break the ladders with load testing, you're not going to have anything to sell. If you take a bite out of every chocolate bar, you're not going to have anything to sell. Now, non-destructive would be ways where you allow the product to be used afterwards. So this could be something like you're doing tolerance testing. You're measuring the size of something coming out of a plant. You want to make sure that they're all the proper size. You're not destroying it. You measure it, and it can go on and be used later. The last thing I want to mention is the destructive and non-destructive as it applies to people's views and ideas. For example, you cannot have a destructive sampling of an election prediction. This is not possible. So when we're talking about destructive and non-destructive, you're usually referring to things which are in a production system. OK, so time for your assignment. If you have any troubles, come and see me. If not, watch the video again, and we'll see you in the next lesson. Mm -hmm.